Hey, it's Rochelle, and you're listening to Clumsy Theosis, a production of Catholic Answers. Welcome to the place to transform the world by transforming yourself. Hey, so let me tell you guys a little embarrassing story about this one time when I thought that I had made a groundbreaking theological discovery. All right, so have you ever noticed that the Gospel of John starts exactly the same way as the first chapter of Genesis, right? They both begin with the words, in the beginning. Well, I have no shame in my game, and so I'm going to tell you that I was in my 20s when I realized this. I had recently come back to the faith, and I was getting acquainted with my Bible, so maybe that gives me some sort of pass. I don't know. But when I made this discovery, I was like, whoa, wait, what? The opening three words of each book are the same. Are you kidding me? I wonder if John knows. No, I'm joking. I didn't take it that far. But I was astonished. But then after I had that, you know, little moment, I had like this other like epiphany. So in John's gospel, the opening, he says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And then I had this like light bulb, and it was like, bing! And I was like, oh my gosh. So John is saying that the word was God. So it was like a person. And oh yeah, Jesus is referred to as the word of God sometimes. And the creation stories in Genesis tell us that everything came into existence by God's word, right? He spoke everything into existence. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it was Jesus. Jesus was the word that brought creation into existence. Does anybody else know this? Oh my goodness, I I couldn't wait to tell the leader of my Bible study, who is now a very close friend of mine, and he reminds me of the story every now and then, you know, just to remind me of my my beginning roots. Um, But yeah, so I remember telling him of this like discovery, and I was super excited. And I remember him staring at me because, I mean, we weren't that close at this time. And so being polite, he just stared at me like he didn't know what to say. But he had this expression on his face. And I interpreted it as, "Um, would you like a cookie? And I realized like, oh, I guess this isn't anything new. Oh, my gosh, I was crushed and a little embarrassed. But I think we all have these moments or at least... I hope that we do. I hope I'm not the only one who has these moments. Um, But I say this because I wanted to point out that John purposefully mimicked Genesis 1 in the beginning of his gospel because he wanted to illustrate that the universe, initially created by God's word, was now being renewed by the word made flesh, Jesus. Like St. Paul says in his second letter to the Corinthians, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. So John is saying the coming of Jesus was such a big deal that it's like a new creation, a new beginning. Now there are fascinating parallels between John's gospel and Genesis 1. And so I say, let's just check them out. So here's a little lightning course on Genesis just to refresh us, right, on Genesis 1. Now, we know that there's seven days in creation because Genesis 1 tells us on the first day, on the second day, on the third day, right? So on the first day, God creates light. He separates the light and the dark to make day and night. On the second day, he separates the waters. Um, So the waters above and the waters below and the waters above, he calls the sky. And on the third day, he formed the water that was below into the sea and the dry land and named the dry land the earth. Also on the third day, he brought about um, fruit-bearing trees. Now, these first three days of creation are the creation of realms, right? But when you have realms, you need something to inhabit it, and God knew that. And so on days four through six, he fills these realms with uh, corresponding inhabitants. So on day four, We get the sun for the day and the moon and the stars for the night, right? Because on the first day, we get the day and the night. On day five, we get the fish for the sea and the birds for the sky because day two, you know, we 
God separates the waters, and so you get the sky above and, you know, the waters below. And then on day six, we get the animals for the land as well as man and woman, right? And we're going to inhabit the earth. And then on the seventh day, we know that God rests, and God also blesses and makes holy this seventh day. Now, by his opening line, John is hearkening his readers back to Genesis 1 on purpose. Now, in Genesis, the seven days are spelled out clear as day. And John (laughs) doesn't say on day one, on day two. What he does is he uses a phrase where he says, on the next day, on the next day. And this is how he delineates the days of creation. And so in John's gospel on the first day, so if you read the very first part of uh, of Gen of Genesis, the very first part of John's gospel, particularly verses four through five, um, we're gonna see that the word Jesus is declared the light of men, and this light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That's what John's gospel is gonna tell us. And the first day of Genesis, the creation is light and dark. Now, on the second day, which is the second time we hear John say, on the next day, this is in verse 29. And in Genesis, on the second day, we hear about the waters. Okay, now in John's gospel, Jesus is being baptized. And you are baptized in what? In water, right? And so John the Baptist, he says that I baptize with water, but Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So we see that renewal aspect, right, of John's gospel. Like, yes, there was, um, you know, John the Baptist was able to baptize with water, but now we have a, like a better baptism. Why? Because Jesus goes into the water and he baptizes the water, so to speak, and then we are baptized with the Holy Spirit because of that. And then on day three, this is going to be John verse 35, Jesus gets his first disciples. All right. And so what does this have to do with day three in Genesis? Because day three in Genesis, we get the sea, the land, and the plants that bear fruit. Well, Christ's ministry is starting to bear fruit, right? Because he gets his first disciples. You see that? And then Christ's disciples are going to go out into the world and they're going to bear fruit themselves. Then the next time, John says on the next day, that's going to be verse 43. And Jesus is going to be calling Nathaniel and Philip to be his disciples. And again, you're like, what does this have to do with day four of Genesis? Because on that day, we get the sun, the moon, and the stars. Well, in Genesis... The sun, the moon, and the stars are said to govern over or to rule over the day and the night. Now, when Jesus calls these two disciples, there's a little exchange between Nathaniel and Jesus after Nathaniel realizes that Jesus is the Messiah. And he says this, he says, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. So Jesus is the son of God. He's the king, right? And so that means that Jesus is here to rule over or to govern the day and the night, which is basically all of time. That's pretty cool. All right, so the seventh day. You might be like, wait, what happened to day five and six, Rochelle? Well, John doesn't give us the fifth and the sixth day because he doesn't say on the next day again. The next time he mentions a different day is in chapter two, verse one, but he doesn't say on the next day. He says on the third day. On the third day from what? The third day from the last day that he mentioned, which was the fourth day. So that makes this the seventh day. And what's happening in chapter 2, verse 1 of John's gospel? It's the wedding feast at Cana. Now, in Genesis 1, God rests on the seventh day, right? Now, this is to indicate the importance of our Sabbath rest, our worship of God. But John, in his gospel... We have Jesus at the wedding of Cana turning water into wine at the request of his mother. And there's a couple of interesting things about this. Now, John Bergsma, if you are not aware of him, you just need to Google him. I think he's absolutely phenomenal. He's a biblical scholar, and he's also a professor at Franciscan University. And he explains this by looking back on the sixth day. And so what is the last thing that God creates on the sixth day? Right On the sixth day, he creates man and woman, Adam and Eve. Now, we don't get that much detail about it in Genesis 1, but in Genesis 2, we get a little bit more information about the creation of Adam and Eve, right? We hear that 
Adam was created out of the clay and that he wanted a helpmate. And so God puts him to sleep, removes his rib, and from that rib, he creates Adam. Sorry. From that rib, (laughs) he creates Eve. Now, when Adam goes to sleep, it's the sixth day. And when he wakes up, then that's going to be the seventh day. And what does he see? Or who does he see, I should say, when he very first wakes up? Eve. And that's when he exclaims, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, right? You all know that, right? Now, in John's gospel on the seventh day at the wedding at Cana, who is the first person mentioned in this story? All right. If you don't know, I'm going to read it to you real quick. So it says, on the third day, there was a marriage at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and Jesus was also invited, right? Jesus is kind of mentioned, just kind of like, oh yeah, Jesus was there too, but who's mentioned first? It's Mary, right? Because Mary is the new Eve, and that's why Jesus addresses her as woman, you know, when he's talking to her, um, when she approaches Jesus and is like, you know, they're out of wine, you need to do something, you need to help them. And Jesus is like, woman, my hour has not yet come. And a lot of people get offended by this and they think it's disrespectful or misogynistic. No, no, no. Jesus does this to emphasize that Mary is the new Eve. She's the new and improved woman from Genesis, right? Because Eve isn't named right away. She's just called woman, right? And that's what Adam calls her. Whoa, you know, this is woman. And just as Eve was created without original sin, so was Mary. Hence, she is the immaculate conception. Now, Jesus and Mary come to the forefront of the story of the wedding at Cana naturally when you read it, right? And it's because, and it becomes obvious that if Mary is the new Eve, then Jesus is the new Adam, right? Now, yes, they are mother and son. They are not man and wife like Adam and Eve, but they will fulfill the command that Adam and Eve were given to be fruitful and multiply, but they do it in a spiritual sense, right? They create a new race of people. You know, who would that be? That would be Christians, right? I just think that is just absolutely phenomenal. Like the way that John lined up Genesis with you know, the the beginning of his gospel and all like the theological significance that it all has in such a short amount of time. It's just, I mean, and that's just the introduction of John's gospel, okay? We've only read what, like 40 something verses. You've got to be kidding me, right? There's so much more meat that you can really sink your teeth into throughout the rest of John's gospel. And yes, that was a pun on John 6. Now, the whole purpose of John's gospel is not to be a biography of Jesus' life or his ministry. In fact, he tells us exactly what his purpose is in John 20, verse 30. He says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And that is why I think that the best reading that you can do during Lent is the Gospel of John. Because throughout Lent, we are preparing ourselves for the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And this Gospel, John's Gospel, prepares us for the central celebration or the feast of the Catholic faith, which is Easter, right? But we do have to go through the passion, death, and resurrection. But I think John helps us do that throughout all of his gospel. In fact, the majority of his gospel is actually going to focus on the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus. But John's gospel is referred to as a mystical gospel, a spiritual gospel, and even a sacramental gospel. I mean, the mystics, if you know I love them, right? And when you read them, the majority of them are focusing on John's gospel or the words or the um, the theological expressions or ideas from John's gospel are just kind of like woven throughout their writings because they're woven throughout their prayers. And that means that they're central, that, they're, that they focus on them so much in their um, prayer lives and in their relationship with the Lord. I mean, this is the time of the year where we really need to get down to 
basics and really need to focus in on the importance of our faith in our life um, and to focus on salvation that we've been given, which is a gift. And John's gospel is amazing for that. And I mean, if you see a discrepancy between his gospel and the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, I would suggest that you not look at it that way, but look at it as, you know, John kind of filling in the gaps of what's kind of missing in the other gospels. Because here, like I said, you get a lot of theological expression or reflection, and that's because this gospel was written in the 90s, right? And so that's a testament to all of the Christian thought at that time, which had been growing and developing thanks to the help of the Holy Spirit since um, Jesus's death and resurrection in 33, right? And I think that these early, early Christians, they really got something that we need to get back to because it's so rich and we just need to bathe ourselves in it. So for this week, I want to encourage you to every day, every day, prayerfully read the first chapter of John's gospel and reread it. Do it slowly and let the Lord enlighten your understanding and your appreciation of what John and the Holy Spirit have given us to chew on. And I know that a lot of you are incorporating uh, spiritual reading, reading of scriptures, praying with the scriptures. Um, And this, I think, since Lent is right around the corner, I think, what, we got like a week, a week to go? I think that you should try try on John by reading his first chapter for this week. And throughout Lent, maybe you will feel so inclined to continue to read his gospel slowly and thoroughly and uh, just ponder over all of the things that the Lord wants to show you through it. And also at Mass. Now, when the bread and the wine become the body and blood of Jesus, remember that water that Jesus turned into wine at the wedding at Cana, right? So when you're at Mass, remember that, and then you can sit there and watch in amazement how that wine is now being turned into his blood on the altar. Now, when the priest says the words, this is my body, instantaneously, that bread is now Jesus's body. When he says, this is my blood, instantaneously, that wine becomes the blood of Christ, right? Now, there is a connection between Genesis and the mass in this regard because the spoken words of the priests, they're not a process of turning the bread and the wine into the body and blood because if they were a process, then that would mean that they would be changing in time, right? But we know that Jesus is outside of time and thus in an instant, the real presence is present because the words of the priest in Persona Christi accomplished what they intended to do, right? Just like at creation, there was no audible word spoken because God was not incarnate, but he, as the word, accomplished what he intended to do in an instant outside of time. And I think that is just wild. And maybe I just totally geeked out on you too much with that. But I think it's important when you're at mass during the consecration to realize like what a miracle that is and what a miracle creation was and just let the Lord like show you and reveal to you more because you were able to acknowledge that. And that's all I have for you today. Um, Contact me on Instagram. I love to hear from you. I love your messages. Follow me on Instagram at Clumsy Theosis. Also, if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, now's the time to do it. I'm available where all podcasts are found. Pretty sure about that. If I'm not, contact me and let me know. Like I said, on Instagram at Clumsy Theosis. And until next time, everybody, peace out. Thank you for tuning in this week to Clumsy Theosis. Each week, we explore a topic within the Catholic faith to aid listeners like yourself, as well as yours truly, in the advancement and deepening of the spiritual life and the personal ownership of our relationship with the big guy upstairs and his church. As cliche as it sounds, the world needs you. Become who you were created to be with Clumsy Theosis, the place to transform the world by transforming yourself.